now that that's a lot of work that I get to do is helping people on the, on the career side, figure out where do I really want to get to? What's really important to me? How do I get clarity? Because engineers and technology people, there's so many directions that can take their career. Hello and welcome to That Tech Show, the show that reveals the magicians behind the magic of everyday technology with me, Chris Adams, and Sam Gregory, who is joining us from a rather unorthodox setting, which may appear like the former Soviet Union for those watching, but is in fact modern day Porto. He's also trying out some new experimental camera setup with his Mac OS, uh, is the latest software. So uh, tell us a little bit about that, Sam. Well, yeah, I mean, you now I've got my phone over there, wirelessly connected, so center stage. Look at this. Woo. And what, what OS is it? Aventura, Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura. Yeah. Set your camera up in landscape. You can then just choose the camera as a normal drop down in all your camera applications, like Zoom and in this case, uh, Zencaster. Woo. And you've got a noise cancelling software on there as well. Oh, yes. Yes. I forgot about that one. Yeah. You wouldn't believe it, but there is traffic blaring right outside. There's actually someone listening to music or something right next to it. I don't know where they are, but yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to this one because I haven't actually heard it back yet be well impressed if it's cut out all this noises around me this will be the one time where it actually has picked up all the noise i'm sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway let's uh, let's crack on with the show so who's the uh, the guest that we've got today Oh, today we have uh, Jeff Perry, who will be talking all about mindset coaching. Uh, Jeff started his career developing products and has switched to developing people, which is clearly his passion. So if you are ready to be inspired today, then do take a listen. Here is Jeff Perry. So my name is Jeff Perry. I'm the founder of More Than Engineering. And, and the work that I do is primarily focused on delivering transformational personal development programs for engineers and tech professionals, really who are trying to level up their, their lives and their careers. My background is kind of wide in mechanical software, manufacturing, engineering, and leadership, product, and, and corporate training. But I like to say in the, in the work that I do, I've kind of moved from developing products and technologies to developing people in the work that I do. And, and so I really, really enjoy it. Was there a moment, was there a particular point in time when you shifted from products to people? Yeah. So it was pretty abrupt for me it was about almost three years ago. I'd had opportunities kind of on the side of the engineering leadership work that I was doing to do training and coaching kind of internal to, to the company um, that I was working at at the time. And I just found that I really loved that work. And, and I found that I looked forward to those days when I was going to be engaged in that work. And I came home kind of energized and excited about the things that I'd done, being able to see that really personal element of seeing people make shifts and changes. And so when I got to kind of one of these career plateaus where I kind of recognized that the main role that I was in maybe wasn't the best fit for me. And I was trying to explore the, the next phase. And I explored some different things with my employer at the time um, to see if, we could change some things around. There wasn't really a, a great mutual fit there. And so kind of took the leap and said, hey, it's time for me to go and uh, decided to take, you know, all these things together, the, the wide engineering and technology background that I had and the, the coaching and training stuff, mm -hmm. put it together and, and build this. And, and that's what I've been doing for the last few years. What was your, your background career before you made the shift? Yeah. So like I said, a number of different things. Um, I, I studied in, in school mechanical engineering, but then in, in the midst of that was involved in some undergraduate research and things that was involved in kind of the software side of the engineering design process. And so I got into some more software things. And so actually my first job out of university was uh, a software development job, but developing tools for engineers like mechanical and electrical engineers to automate systems and processes that they did over and over again in a large automotive company. So I did that for a few years, but I recognized it didn't take me too long to recognize that for me, writing code all day wasn't a great fit for, for me uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I tried to take all the things that I could about learning about automating processes and agile methodologies and learning products and how to scope things out and and things like that. I tried to learn a lot from that, but then I went back to more of the mechanical and manufacturing uh, type roles and was even connected with the product side 
of things, but in a smaller company now. So I got to wear a lot more hats, was in my first leadership opportunity, trying to grow a team, build some new products that connected software and hardware and kind of an IoT application. So what was it about the software on a day-to-day basis that wasn't really fitting for you? What you got against software? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything against software. Um, I just, I just felt that like the the operation for me of of being there, and it perhaps could have been as much as anything that the environment that I was in wasn't as collaborative of an environment as, as really something that energized me. And so it was a lot of time just me spending time at my computer trying to think through how do I hack away at the the user stories that I was. Uh, creating and different things like that. And so I felt pretty disengaged from the bigger picture uh, of, of what was going on in, in that work. And so, you know, it could have been just as much as like, you know, like I said, the, the engagement uh, approach of, you know, being in a very large company um, as much as the, the software itself. And so, but but I'm someone who, who likes to do a lot of different things. And so when I went into a smaller company, got to wear a lot of different hats. Um, and still connect with some of the software work that was going on, but connect that with the hardware pieces too. That was really interesting to me and start to, to build uh, you know, product and strategy and stuff like that. So what was it about that smaller company that really got you going then? Was it just the variety of things you were having to do? Or was the, is it, was it the, the actual nature of the business? What was it that really you know, got the juices flowing? Yeah, variety, the, the, the challenge and the increased level of responsibility that I was given to to say hey I wasn't just like you know a part of a, a team I was I was own, now owning a team and and trying to build something out and and trying to s- almost build a new market for for some of the technologies that we had and, and grow new applications of that um, the the application was actually interesting uh, the company had had a long history of doing data acquisition devices and 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 hardware sensors to sense things in like agricultural situations to optimize water usage and stuff like that and in agriculture and, and other things and i was applying that then to to cities and and stormwater usage um, to to improve water quality and things like that sensing a lot of things and, and giving the the right feedback there is a really interesting thing from a from an infrastructure perspective, and I had to collaborate with with a lot of different types of engineers, even like civil engineers, and sort of some of the applications we were doing, sitting government planners and things like that. So it was really broad, and some of the ways that I needed to to collaborate with different stakeholders in the work I was doing, um, from the stakeholder side and also the the technology side, bringing in the right data, using the right sensors and the right technologies, and and delivering that data in a way that was was useful. How how long you, were you doing this for then? Uh, both doing the the software development into this role. What what were the sort of timescales that you were experiencing in this? Yeah, so it was about three years in the software development pure, um, and then into another three or four years into this this new role of growing teams in in the in the smaller company. Um, and then inside that smaller company was you know a couple years in, uh, they actually merged or bought a another company. And as part of that, went through a rebranding process. And I like to say we kind of had the, an identity crisis trying to figure out new new identity and new strategy and things like that. And, and so as part of that, brought in some consultants to do some training for the leadership team, which I was a part of. And, and then uh, I got to you know, design and, and deliver some things to continue to, to deliver training across the entire organization. Um, and so that's what sort of got me peaked in this interest of getting opportunities to do training and, and coaching and things like that to say, hey, how do we implement the strategies and even more um, philosophical methodologies? We're doing a lot of things from a from a mindset perspective and how do we approach how we work together and collaborate and things like that and seeing the ways that people shifted um, how they approach their work was, was just really fascinating. And I don't say this lightly, but it literally changed my life and the trajectory of how I've taken my career. That was that was over five years ago that began, and then you know a couple of years later, I decided to start my own thing and 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 launch that. So it's been a fun process. That's cool. So a bit of a meta question in some ways. So when you uh, organized this training, were you asked to do that, or did you sort of do it yourself, like take the initiative? I suppose. Yeah, so I kind of raised my hand uh, and said, "Hey, if there's if there's 
you know, we, we want to get serious and, and go beyond just a leadership team and take this to the rest of the company. I'm happy to be a part of, of the people that do that. And so we had some discussion and said, yeah, let's, let's do this. And so that, that was still kind of a, a side thing for me. I'd say 10, 15% of my time maybe was, was spent on doing some of that stuff. I uh, still had my, my main job responsibilities, but something that was just really fun. Like I said, I sort of lit up and, and really enjoyed that work and, you know, looked for ways to do more and more of that as time went on, right? You know, what was the thing that was driving you? Was it being able to teach people how to work better, to collaborate better, or was it the career development thing? Because I, I know that you kind of do both, right? So so originally, I mean, it, within the context of the organization, it was it was teaching, you know, how to how do we work better and collaborate within the organization, but but saw as I started my own company that the career development piece opened up because hey, some of those um questions that I had, you know, early on as I was mentioned earlier, kind of ha- hit that plateau. And it's like, okay, what's next in my career? That idea of like, okay, how do I get clarity on what I want to do? What's interesting to me? How do I, how do I figure out what that next step is? That felt really ambiguous to me at the time. That was something that I was really working through. And I, as I was doing kind of my own customer discovery work, you might say, um, as I was starting my own, uh, starting more than engineering, recognize that that's something that a lot of people were trying to figure out uh, on the career side, as well as connecting to how do I build uh, the person and the personal development and, and, and the leadership and some of the mindset stuff that I wanted to bring in as well. And so, so now that, that that's a lot of work that I get to do is helping people on the, on the career side. How do we figure out where do I really want to get to? What's really important to me? How do I get clarity? Because, you know, engineers and technology people, there's so many directions they can take their careers, right? So many different applications, industries, you know, technologies and things that they could use. And they're trying to figure out what do I really want to do? And how do I map that with what my best skills are and trying to figure that out? And so that's a lot of the work that I get to do with with people these days. So, so how do you go about like figuring out what all of the options are for you know everyone's <laughs> careers because you're a young guy right you haven't done it all yourself but what, what but what how do you figure out what the the scope is of possibility and which things are working for people and which things aren't yeah so i mean it comes down to asking really important and uh, and focused questions um helping people uncover the things that are really important to them i like to, i like to think about when we're talking about like getting career clarity it's like you know, with all the different options out there, it, it's not like you're going to map out this this perfect treasure map and and X marks the spot and everything. But but you can get to the point where you can get clarity around like what's the north star, right? Or or what's a set of filters of things that as opportunities and new new things come your way, how can you you know use that and figure out okay, is this something I want to continue to explore and pursue? And then we can make decisions from that place, right? So I, I like to take the approach that I don't have the answers for them, but I go through the process to ask questions to help them uncover those things that are really important to them. What is that North Star? What are those set of filters and things that are really important to them? Then they can make those decisions from that place and be able to get that clarity themselves. So I, I just am this guide on the side if you if you will guide on the side that's a nice little uh yeah nice little thing <laughs> there must be some foundational things that you take people through because of course you you wouldn't ask them what their favorite color was you know or i mean that's important to understand but you know it's it <laughs> may not be applicable to this particular situation <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so you you must have like a sort of framework then that do you have that kind of mapped out or is it bespoke to each individual person yeah so it's it's a mix so i have some uh, a base set of materials and and uh and some online training and things that i put together with the clients i work through so there's some things i work through on their own time and and then we really personalize that in our uh coaching calls and things like that so some of the base tools like i like to apply in some cases engineering or and uh, and other technical principles and and tools to you know, us, us as people. So just one example, when I was doing work that connected in, in that smaller company, we were connecting with even manufacturing and, and we were building the, the sensors and, and the devices on site. And, and so whenever there was a, a quality issue or something that we needed to address, 
uh, we're trying to get down to the root cause of the issue, right? And and you can uh, appreciate this in, in software too. Um, need to say, hey, let's not just solve the, the surface level thing. Let's actually get to the root cause and, and figure out what to do. And so one of the tools we use was called the five whys, right? And so maybe you're familiar with this. And it's, I thought I found that one coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's, it's a tool that can be used in all sorts of different areas. And so we can do that in, in a root cause scenario, you know, saying, hey, what's, what's the issue? Why is that happening? And go five whys deep or why, 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 why? But how do we apply that in our personal lives? Like, okay, what is a, a big goal that I want to achieve in my life or my career? Okay, why is that important to me? Right. So if it's a it's a certain amount of money you want to make or a certain type of job or industry you want to work in, why is that important? OK, then you answer that question. OK, why is that important to you? Answer that question. You go a few levels deep. Five is kind of the uh, you know number, but you can go you know certainly deeper, six, seven, eight levels deep. You're trying to get down to that deeper level of why. What's that intrinsic motivation that's really driving why this is important? And so then you can go from, OK, I have this goal. But now I understand why this is actually important to me. And that's what's really going to drive the process. And we can go back to that. You know, we're always going to get faced with challenges or roadblocks or obstacles to deal with. If I can dig deep into that deeper level of why, that, that's one thing. Another one that I use a lot with people is, called, is this idea of a genius zone, which is trying to say, what are the things that you do uniquely, you know, really well, um, almost compared to anyone else. And that can be a combination of types of technologies or skills that, that you have. And when, when combined, you have a really, you know, rare set of, of things that, that you can do differently and in, in perspective, wh- whether that's because you've worked in different industries, have had different interests. When you combine that, suddenly you have a different perspective than, than most people in the world do. So that's one way to look at it. So another way to look at it is, is like, what are those times that you feel like you're just in, uh, in, in that flow mode, that flow state where you're just doing your absolute best work? What is it that you're really doing um, whether that's uh, the, the type of work that you're doing, the ways that you're working with people, how you set that up, and how do we figure out how to do more of that? Because if you can do that, then you're going to enjoy yourself. Like, like that's a really happy place to be in when you balance that almost challenge, but also proficiency that you have. But also um, you're going to be able to deliver greater value to a potential employer or in the work that you're doing. It, and I didn't understand some of these or, or as clearly when I first started the, uh, the business that I'm doing now, but, but think about that in hindsight, right? So I have this vast, you know, wide engineering background and I really love the coaching, you know, so connect this combination that's perhaps unique to me, but also that that's something where I feel like I'm really like feeling alive and excited and engaged in that sort of work. So on both sides of that, that's, that's some of the work. And so putting all that together, I'm kind of operating in my genius zone, right? Not just something that I'm good at, but something that really is, is something that's, that's unique and different uh, for me compared to others. How long does it take for people to find that genius zone? Like how much coaching does it take to, to identify that? Um, there's, there's no magic number there, <laughs> uh, Chris. Um, uh, for some people, it could be could be one session, or they spend uh, a couple hours in kind of reflection with themselves, and and some of the questions and exercises I give them to go through, and they they come come out at, with that, and, and they're like, oh wow, I I didn't realize this before, but that's something that I really really love doing, or that's some these are a, a unique combination of things that that I do really really well. Like for for someone, it was like they're really good when there's ambiguity in like a greenfield project and they can take something that's really ambiguous and, and they get excited rather than some people get like really, you know, afraid of that ambiguity. Right. And so they get excited about that applied to certain technologies and connecting with different stakeholders. And they're like, Hey, I recognize that when I've been in those projects and those situations, I'm really thriving and at my best. And so they can they can identify that as a, as a genius zone, whereas they would not be in their genius zone 
if they're in a technological situation, perhaps where they're sort of like, hey, this thing's already established and I'm just maintaining and doing small continuous improvements and stuff. And uh, where other people would be really great at that and continuing to, to optimize things over and over and over again, that wouldn't be optimal for some people. And so anyway, so those are uh, just some examples. Other people, like another client I had, she was a, a PhD level scientist and engineer. Um, and so it done a lot of deep research, but she also had opportunities to work with stakeholders and work on leadership training and stuff like that. And she said, and, and she loved working on projects and she didn't really realize even that like technical project management was even a thing that was possible for her at, at the time. And, but, but she recognized these different pieces, put it together, recognized, Hey, that, that's a, that's a, direction she could take in her career. And now, now she's really thriving at like a national lab here in the U S working on highly technical projects, utilizing her, her deep technical expertise, but leading the projects and the programs uh, to fruition and working with the different stakeholders. And she, she loves it, but she didn't know that that was even an option for her, but it combined these, these things, uh, in, in new ways. What was the process of say, finding that niche? That, you know, was was that something that you were just able to connect from what she was telling you? You know, or was it something else? Yeah. So again, this is something that she, in the end, found that answer. It's not something I said. Hey, look, look at these things. Like, like you found that. But asking those questions, and then in, also part of that is inviting people to to go have some exploratory conversations with people doing different things in different industries and different types of roles, right? Like informational interviews. Um, seeing like what's possible. And this particular area sort of came sort of out of nowhere, um, you know, through through some personal connections. And she said, oh, wait, that, that's interesting. Um, but she's able to explore that a little bit more. And so, you know, for her, that was within uh, a couple months, she was like, okay, like I realized that the project management may be something I want to explore. Then she tested the water. She took like some project management courses and she really found that she thought that that was really interesting. And then she started exploring career opportunities and different things like that. And, and it's now, you know, on a, on a new trajectory that she really enjoys. So what, what sort of um, condition are people in when they come to you? Because it sounds like you've got a bit of psychiatry <laughs> going on here as well. <laughs> uh, I would not call myself a therapist, <laughs> but people do generally come to me uh, in some form of frustrated state. Sure. Right. So, so they are feeling underwhelmed, unengaged, maybe underpaid, um, or, or in some cases unemployed uh, in trying to figure out what, what's next. Right. Or, uh, you know, or maybe they're, they're in a job. They're like, Hey, this is, this is fine, but it's not really lighting me up and it's not really where I want to stick around or I recognize another industry I want to get into, uh, or things I want to try and figure that out. But like uh, this person I was mentioning there that, that eventually moved into technical project management, one of the things that she shared with me, she's like, I, I'm a highly educated, you know, experienced professional, but I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Mm. Right. And uh, in doing some of the work, she realized why was that so important for her to figure that out? Well, she she didn't connect this until we were working together. Like, you know, there's some of the why this was so important to her to figure out was that she recognized that growing up, both of her parents really despised their careers. And she saw that and, and they were unhappy and that, you know, affected their family life and different things like this. And she's like, I don't, I don't want that to be me. I really want to enjoy my career and my life and different things and, you know, connect these things that I really want to do. And so, um, she saw this opportunity and, and she saw this motivation to really kind of figure this out. Another person I worked with, um, you know, really ambiguous thing is like, I want to find my happy place in my, in my career. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? It's like, I, I'm not really sure. Okay, let's figure that out. And so we did. And, and he thought that he needed to find a new job and it was a, his external environment. But actually, most of the things that he changed, and this was more on the mindset stuff, he changed him and how he approached how he was thinking about his career and his work and how he was working with people. So you're sure you're not a therapist, Jeff? I'm sure. <laughs> I, I don't have any of those. In fact, I had someone the other day I was talking to. I was like, I don't know if I need a coach or a therapist. I was like, well, maybe both. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
and this particular person decided to go the therapist route first before we worked together. But, uh, you know, if, if people are dealing with significant anxiety and depression and all that stuff, like, no, sure. I mean, that is, you know, it's, 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 it's deeper, but yeah, it sounds like for helping people to find their mojo, I suppose, and their, you know, their, their happy place, you know, very much in a career basis. Um, the uh, in terms of like that, that five wise technique is a pretty cool technique, right? It's a great way of digging in and finding what the root causes. Is, you know, we use it in incident management an awful lot. What other techniques have you got that help to identify some of this? Well, either the mindset, which which side should we dive in first, career or mindset? Well, in my mind, it's all kind of related, right? So from the mindset idea is that um, a lot of times we're trying to change things again in our external situation or how we approach things. But if we're wanting to, to set a new goal or reach a new objective, so often we start prescribing behaviors or new actions or things we need to do differently. But if we as a person and how we think about these opportunities and challenges and people don't change, like our mindsets, then a lot of times we get drawn right back to our previous way of operating and, and doing things because we've just prescribed actions, but we didn't actually change how we think about that. So, so that's, that's why in my mind and, and uh, what I've seen in, in research and things too, is that if we can shift the mindsets and then build on top of that, a foundation of the actions and the behaviors we want to build, then that's going to lead to sustainable changes and results. Okay. So how do we, how do we go about changing some mindsets then? Yeah. So when it comes to, to things we're trying to change here, um, there's kind of four stages here, right? So if, if there's something we're really struggling with, uh, we start out at a stage of unconscious incompetence. Okay. This means I'm not aware of th that I'm bad at something. <laughs> so, so the first step is really awareness. So it goes from unconscious incompetence, incompetence to conscious incompetence. So now suddenly I'm aware and I, and so that's some of the first things we do. We do some, some training and assessments around mindsets to gain awareness of where am I really at today? So, so how, how do we first start to identify where we might have unconscious incompetence? <laughs> Cause I think that's a really important thing to find, right? Yeah. So just to, just to give you an example of someone I was working with just yesterday. Okay. So um, one, of the, one of the mindsets we work on, um, this comes from a group called the Arbinger Institute, and, and it's called the, the kind of dichotomy of, of mindsets is an inward and an outward mindset. Inward mindset is kind of really self-focused on, on me and what I'm trying to accomplish. And, and so I kind of see everyone else as objects. It's just in my way or, or people that I can use in different ways, right? The opposite side is of that, the more positive mindset is an outward mindset, really considering other people. This person I was working with um, went through some of the, the base training and, and an initial assessment on it. And he realized you know, some of these questions around like, do I consider other people in my work? Um, and do I care about what others are caring about? He's like, I don't even think about that in in the work that I do, like, I just don't consider, I just sort of show up and, and do my thing. And I have my headphones all day and I don't really talk to people. And wow, I realized that no wonder I haven't been really progressing very much in my career because um, I haven't been building those meaningful relationships and really trying to consider what's good for the team rather than what's good for me, right? That now moves then into a conscious uh, incompetence. Exactly. He just wasn't even aware that he wasn't considering that and why, and that that would even be important. Does it sometimes take a while to, to realize that? For some people? Yeah. I think, you know, the, the value of an assessment, like they get a, they get a number and they see themselves on a visual scale and things like that. Like <laughs> that makes it easier. It, it looks like they're getting data and like, okay, I can see, you know, there, there's a gap here. There's, there's some work to do. So that, that makes it pretty easy for people to to see, okay, there perhaps there's some things I need to work on here, right? But it can take some time to figure out, okay, how do we apply that? So that next stage is is going from conscious incompetence to conscious competence. So really, it's still all a conscious work, um, but we're starting to make improvements. You know, like we still have to really think about it and and start asking questions and, and trying to be, you know, increase our awareness and saying, okay. Instead of, you know, operating from this old way of being, how can I approach this situation in a new way? 
right? And, and apply that in my current work, or maybe apply that, you know, in the in the career perspective, if they're trying to find a new career opportunity, think about like networking and, and things like that. How do I approach, you know, reaching out to a new person in a way that is genuinely interested in connecting with that person and building a meaningful relationship? Or maybe if you're going into a job interview, really connecting and sharing things that are important for that company to help them succeed rather than, I feel like I deserve this new role, right? Because I'm awesome. And so they need to see how great I am, right? So that's a different phase. And so so we're trying to be really aware of how we're approaching these relationships and these interactions with people that moves to more conscious competence. And eventually as we practice and it becomes more, more second nature, we move to unconscious competence. Then it becomes more of a default mindset right? And um, that's, that's, the, that's the process. So from unconscious incompetence, all the way through conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence, which becomes more of this is who I am now, rather than I have to really think about this consciously over time. So that's kind of the, the a high level process of that change. How long does it normally take to go through such a, a cycle? I mean, or does it depend really on how deep the competences are? Yeah, I, I think it does depend. And 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 truly, I don't know that you're ever, quote unquote, done. Sure. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, for me personally, it's been five years since I've been you know, over five years since I've been deep into kind of this this mindset shift work. And I remember in the early days when I was teaching whole workshops on on these ideas and, and then I would come home and, and uh, my wife would be like, hey, seems like you're really getting a lot out of this at work and you're really enjoying this. I'm like, yeah, I am. It's like, and she's like, Hey, um, seems like you're not always actually living those ideals when you come home. Sometimes there's two different versions of you that come home. Sometimes you're really, you know, engaged with me and the kids. And sometimes you're really still caught up in yourself. It's like, Oh crap, you're right. <laughs> and, and we still have to have those conversations from time to time. Okay. So um, even though I'm, I'm teaching these things, they're, they're, you're never done. But uh, I, I find that, you know, for me personally, in my personal development, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to, to connect with these ideas and share them with others, because it helps keep me keep those ideas on the forefront for me, what I'm trying to do. So so some people, when you're asking about timeline, like you can make some big changes, even just this guy we were talking about earlier, like, hey, even just as where just just this week, and he took an assessment, and, and he started making changes, like, I started actually like, I talked to four people that I wouldn't have otherwise talked to yesterday, you know, <laughs> and, and, and that, and they're probably like, well, what, what, what's happening here? And so he started consciously changing how he's approaching people, you know, day one. Like, so some things can happen really quick and, and start to take some of those actions. Um, and then over time, that becomes a, a bigger thing for him. So we've all got our little side projects going on. Have you uh, hired some people to work on your little projects? Oh, absolutely. I'm useless at design. There's a few services out there, though, right, to find people. Where, where do you go? The best place that I've gone, if I was to pick one of these services, is probably Fiverr. It's a bit misleading, though, isn't it? Because they're not going to be a Fiverr. No. <laughs> but, you know, with all these side projects, we don't want it to cost the world. We just want a little bit of help on a little bit of copywriting or a bit of design that we can't do ourselves. And shouldn't really attempt to do it because you're going to do a bad job otherwise if it's not your if it's not your kettle of fish don't boil the frog there's a mixed metaphor if ever you heard one <laughs> <laughs> get someone on fiverr they'll do it much quicker the prices are very very reasonable unless you want to go to the fiverr preferred members and get your startup up sooner and you can uh, throw into that tech show at the same time by heading over to thattech.show or taking a look in the description and clicking the affiliate link and you can try out Fiverr and you can uh, be supporting that tech show whilst you're doing it. Because we get a little bit of a kickback. Give it a go. Venture into the world of outsourcing. Your, your life will change at Fiverr.com. With that conscious competence... How how are you working on whether that is aligned with your genius zone? Because you could find that actually this is something I'm not working on, like this person who you mentioned, maybe they weren't communicating. 
well, what if they're not even in the right role? And yeah, they need to be speaking to someone, but it's maybe not their genius zone in the first place. Like, are the are these two assessments kind of happening in parallel, or is it very uh, linear process that you're taking people through? That's a great question, Sam. And and I, so I'd say they are they're kind of in parallel uh, in a sense. The, the mindset pieces is more of like, how do I think and approach things? The, the genius zone is aligning more your skills and your interests and things like that. And so, so going one level deeper in terms of like the, the philosophy around this, like developing a technical skill, okay? Um, if you wanted to learn a new software or learn a new process or something like that, that's a different process than developing sort of a mindset or... Um, or a different sort of skill that that uh, psychologists will actually call these technical changes that we're trying to make. You know, hey, I'm trying to learn a technical idea or process. I take a course and I can learn that and suddenly in practice and I can become competent in that technical skill. But these other processes, we're changing how we think, how we operate, almost like our belief systems. They call that an adaptive change. Like we need to adapt, not just uh, that we are learning something new, but that we're changing what we believe and how we operate, okay? And so some of the mindset things kind of moving from unconscious incompetence all the way to unconscious competence, that process, that's more the adaptive change. They're trying to shift how we operate and what we believe through this process and how we see other people and stuff like that. Whereas the, the genius zone is connected with some of that in some ways, but it's more connected to like, where am I already like at my best and how can I combine some of these things in different ways to, to really come alive and do great work and, and stuff like that. So that's more of a, an awareness of how they align strengths and, and passions and interests and also needs of, of employers and stuff like that compared to the mindset shifting process, which is like, how do I shift how I operate within the scope of the interactions and the challenges and things that I'm facing right now. Does that make sense of difference? Yeah, it, it kind of does, but I guess that's where I'm having trouble because you're, you, you mentioned scope, right? You mentioned that they're trying to change their mindset within this scope. And, but what if that scope in itself is wrong, such as, you know, what if talking to people just didn't matter if their genius zone was, I don't know, the, the being a being a, uh, an olympic swimmer or something like that you know they were deeply unhappy with their office job and they actually really want to be an olympic swimmer then really you're you're talking about them communicating with their peers which is a pointless conversation when someone is they need to find themselves a personal trainer uh shave all the hair off their body and slip into that water <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you know what i mean that's the you you, you 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 the scoping is is automatically wrong you're going into that with a, with the wrong scope correct and so so there's there's people who who i've worked with who have aligned in terms of okay is, is the scope of what they're working on not aligned with both their their skills their genius zones and also their their passions and what their interests are so i've had people make complete industry shifts from you know, a particular type of technology to like uh, green energy or something like that, right? Because that's something that they're like, hey, something I'm really interested in. Or some people really want to, you know, go, f I had someone who they were doing like supply chain stuff, but they really wanted to get into robotics and autonomous um, vehicles and things like that, because they saw a future in that they're connected with that. Other people who have a huge passion connection uh, and can apply their technical skills in, in like space travel, getting into jobs at like Blue Origin and things like that. And want to be connected with some of the lunar landers or, uh, you know, new space stations and stuff like that, because they see a future for people in space and they want to be connected with that passion. They have an ability to use their technical skills to that end. And, and so it, it lights them up from a motivation for what they're working on and they can apply their unique skills in that way as well. Uh, whereas before, maybe they were just working on a design of some machine that they're like, okay, this is this is okay, but it's not really my ideal, right? So, so sometimes, you know, we can we can shift those things. So maybe they may or may not be 
working in the same function. So sometimes it's a function issue. Uh, like this is the type of role that I'm doing in terms, you know, in a software world, maybe it's, it's development, full stack, QA, um, architecture, you know, higher level things, or, or am I diving into certain types of technologies, or am I working with the data, or am I working on AI or machine learning, like all sorts of different things in, in maybe that sort of realm, or also the industry, the application, and something that really lights them up, gets them excited. You know, if they're working on something that, hey, am I optimizing, you know, payments I'm, I'm taking on a, on a marketing platform or am I working on things that have a healthcare benefit or something like that? Some people are just going to get a lot more excited about things like that. So um, or helping small businesses or, or whatever. So so there's a number of levels of alignment in, in the role and the function that unlocks their genius zone and the, and how they design their work and also perhaps the industry and the application there as well. You mentioned that we're always working on it. You know, it's never, it's ne- never an ending thing. So, do you think, do you think this is something that everyone should that needs, and it's it's almost like a personal trainer at the gym, or are there some people out there who just really fight? You 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 think they've got it? They they've got discipline. They're switched on, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, you're asking me and I'm a little bit biased, right? And so I'll be honest uh, <laughs> that, that that I'm going to be on that side and say, hey, I'm just a believer that we all need help and support. And that's that's only going to help us in most situations. Okay. We're trying to make big changes. We're trying to improve. We're trying to operate at our best. Hey, you know, the, the best athletes in the world have, have, have trainers and coaches. And, and if you want to be the best in, in software or leadership or, or taking the next step in your career, you're only going to improve by having a, a coach and support in that process. And that can be certainly something that you can invest in. And I'm also a believer that the best in investment that's going to have the best ROI is an investment in yourself, um, even financially and an investment of time and energy. But certainly we can also just have people and mentors and, and a support system in our lives that we can lean on. So we don't necessarily need to be paying for a coach all the, you know, all the time so that we can operate our best, but, but have other support systems and people that we can lean on who can tell us the truth and help us see things that we can't see in ourselves because, because we can be blind to our own uh, things at times. I, I would absolutely say, say, yes, we all need to have those sorts of people in our lives. So I notice on your uh, website, you have a number of workshops and sessions and things that are available. Um, you've got one that's called Why Entrepreneur. Uh, what? what oh, I've, I've messed it up now because I'm trying to pronounce some French. Why Entrepreneurship? <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that one's really interesting to me because you get a lot of people who think that they just need to start a business. And I know that you know many years ago, I was in that same sort of boat of, I want to start a business, not necessarily thinking about what the end goal was. Is there something in that coaching session that you you talk about that? Can you unpack that a little bit? Uh, and, and Chris, I'm not actually exactly sure where you found that, and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to. Ah, it's on your more than engineering website. It, it is, is there. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is, but but it may be a little bit old. I'm actually in the in the process of uh, updating that that website. It's, there's some things that need to be changed there, but I think. I mean, for some people, right, they, they recognize, you know, why they might want to do that. And, and, and I think the context for that session in particular is I've spoken to some entrepreneurship groups. Okay. And so there are already people who are thinking about entrepreneurship, but I'm trying to connect them back to why they're doing it in the first place. You know, what's, what's the purpose? Because, because a lot of people, you know, if they're thinking about starting a business or, or something like that, or wanting to be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, there's the, there's this magical dream of like, hey, I'm going to you know make all this money and have all this freedom and, and work on the beach or whatever that dream is for them. But then they end up creating a business that takes more of their time and sucks more of their energy than what they were doing before. And then they realize they're not actually, you know, enjoying themselves. Right. So it, it's a similar idea of like that five whys idea that we were talking about earlier, like, like what is the purpose? And, and, and another mentor of mine kind of has this analogy where he's like, Hey, if you're trying to build something like build the castle first, 
you know, what you want to create and live from that place and then build the, the, the moat around that to protect that, the strategic and the economic moat, like in how you're going to be paid and the strategy around that, how you operate the business. Because otherwise, if we try to build the moat first and we're just like filling up and we haven't actually designed the, the castle of, of, of how we want our, our business and our life to operate in this new space, right? So it's connecting with some of those ideas. But, and, and my believer that everyone needs to be an entrepreneur in order to, to live a great life that they're excited about, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> I help people get employee jobs all the time that they're really excited about. They enjoy and they feel like they're growing and they're, they're, they're developing it, right? I, I do that all the time. And part of this has got to be to do with finding goals, right? And setting goals. Yeah. So, so how do you how do you advise people on setting goals? I mean, because there's that old phrase of like, you know, uh, shoot, reach for the stars and you might hit the moon. For example, I'm going to, you know, this terribly paraphrased. How how do you get people to set sort of realistic goals versus the lofty, um, big hairy goal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's validity to, to all of it. You know, shooting for the stars that can, that can help us in big ways, and so like the the audacity of our goals is an interesting balance and it's something I struggle with personally, right? Like, hey, do I want to, you know, shoot like crazy and, and go go big? Or is that going to be, you know, discouraging if I don't reach that for one reason or another? I want to talk a little bit more about how do we approach how we see the progress that we're making? Because I think so often, uh, and this comes from a concept from business coach and entrepreneur, uh, Dan Sullivan. Who, who recently, about a year ago, wrote a book with uh, another guy named Benjamin Hardy. And it's called The Gap in the Game. And, and, and pretty much, essentially, the idea is that so often, we as people are focused on the gap, the gap between where I'm at now and this ideal of who I want to be, who I wish I'd be, and or maybe comparing ourselves to other people and the progress that they're making, right? So we always are in this feeling of lack when we're in the gap, right? Whereas more powerfully is if we can operate and live from the gain is, is looking at, okay, look at where I'm at now compared to where I used to be. The progress, the things I've learned, the wins, uh, the opportunities I have, you know, so from like a, a say purely financial perspective, maybe some people uh, like, like he's done this because he, he coaches entrepreneurs and he's asked plenty of people like, Hey, are you happy with the amount of these are people who are making like, $200,000 plus a year. And he's like, are you happy with the, the amount of money that you're making right now? And, and not many would, would raise their hands in, in a group of people. But um, then he'd say, well, hey, are, are you making more than you used to? And almost everyone you know, raises their hands, uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, are you making more than you, you were a couple of years ago? And almost everyone raised their hands like, you know, why are you not satisfied with that? Why are we always in this feeling of lack? Even though probably a couple of years ago, where they're at now, is actually what their goal was, right? So, so sometimes we can even reach our goals and be like, quote unquote, living our dreams and still not be satisfied. So there's a thing there about celebrating success, right? So how, how do we keep perspective of that? <laughs> yeah, so I do that in an exercise since I, since I read that book and, and learned that um, concept. On a quarterly basis, I do a, a gap in the gain exercise where I actually go through in, in a journal and kind of look at different time scales, look at the last 30 days, look at the last 90 days, look at the last year, and only and just bullet out lists. This only takes me about a half an hour. But but I'm always amazed by what I come out of this and, and how I how I feel when I do this. Um, I, I look and I just list the wins, the progress, the the positive things, you know, things I'm celebrating and excited about from those different time scales. And it keeps, you know, on a regular basis, my mind primed for the progress I've made. And, and certainly I can go back and reflect on some of the goals I made and, and things that I did or didn't achieve in that context. Jumping back to um, coaching just a little bit, how important do you think it is to change up your coach? And, and how often would you, might, might you do that? Yeah. So just talking from personal experience over the last few years, um, even in my business and things like that, I've had different coaches and I think I'm on kind of my third iteration of, of, of a coaching program that I'm a part of personally. 
And I, and I find that different coaches and different approaches we might need at different times and different ways. So it's important to, to feel like, you know, to kind of assess if, if you're working with a coach, are, are you still feeling like you're making big progress? Or if you feel like you've sort of slowed down or, or this coach may or may not have the approach or the ability to, to work with you in, in, in the areas that you feel like you most need, then you may need to reevaluate. So I've found value in getting different perspectives and different coaches o- over the course of my life. Um, and I know that people that I've worked with have worked with other coaches in some cases. I, although for, I think, the majority of people that I've worked with, I'm usually the first coach that they've worked with because I think engineers and technology people, they don't think of this as something that they really need very often because because you know, so much in the mindset of we're problem solvers, we're smart. We can, if there's a problem, we can figure it out and we can do that on our own. And the idea of getting a coach is new to a lot of people, but the people that have had different coaches have really uh, appreciated that, whether that's coaches or, or training programs or systems that exist in their organizations, right? Sometimes that exists or, or mentoring programs and things like that, um, or something that they've, you know, identified and and invested in, and you know, personally. So, outside of those uh, programs you've mentioned, where does one go about finding a coach? Well, I'd say you can go to www.morethan-engineering.com. It's a great place to go. Nice little <laughs> uh, plug. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or or uh, or engineeringcareeraccelerator.com is is another website I've got. But um, finding people anywhere, whether that's social media that you hang out on, or um, certainly spend some time on, on Google or podcasts that you listen to uh, or different things and, and people that are talking about areas and, and things that you want to work on, right? And you want to improve because because having a coaching relationship is a really personal thing, right? Like you, you want to feel connected with them. You want to feel that confidence that that they have the ability to, to help you through what you're trying to accomplish. And, and so you want to feel comfortable with that. Um, and so I'm happy to talk with people, certainly, uh, if they want to explore that, and I'm only going to say yes and suggest we work together if I feel confident that we can, that, that we're a good fit and, and they need to feel that as well. And if not, then that's okay. But, uh, and, and I have other people that I can point them to. I've got other friends in the space that do some similar things. So I'd say, go have a few conversations, go, go do, do some searching and find some people, have a few conversations and see who feels right for you. And then give it a try, invest in it and, and see see what you can accomplish through that process. Yeah, because I, I I mean, I did this pretty much a similar thing. I, I had a coach, but I interviewed a bunch of coaches before I did that and just, just got a sense of what their experience was, um, where their kind of specialties lie. What, what were they like as a person, you know? Did I bounce off of them? Were they were they fun to fun to work with? So, um, but what I found was after a, after a few weeks or a few months, actually, it just sort of felt like we were, we were stagnating. We weren't really getting anywhere. And you know, I just it just you know, it sort of occurred to me that actually maybe changing up a coach is a good thing. They reassess. They make you change it. I, it's just it's quite hard finding a coach though you know to your question as well chris like i just found i was for two weeks i was just interviewing people and just whatever and it was it's exhausting and to think like if changing up is a good thing <laughs> it's like oh i have to do that every few three months or few, few weeks do you know what i mean yeah but but it's it's work worth doing if if it's something important to you it's not supposed to be the easiest thing. Um, but, but like we said, you know, it, you know, you, you found some, some value out of that. you got to a stagnation point. And, and so you, you know, if you want just any coach, then great, you know, you can just pick one and go, but, but you really cared about finding the right coach for you. And so you're willing to put in that time, just like anything else that you were investigating or trying out and things like that. Like you want to spend that time if you're, if, if it's something important to you. So, so it's work worth putting in. Yeah, it's not the easiest necessarily. This feels like a really bad analogy, but it seems like it's like finding a good hairdresser. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it can take a long time. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough hair to, to to justify going to find a good hairdresser. My wife actually cuts my hair, so so I've got a great hairdresser. You don't need to change <laughs> up at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> so one one thing we haven't really talked about so much is leadership. 
So you do leadership coaching as well. How do you, um, what, what sort of areas of leadership are we talking about here? And how is it, is it cultural change within organizations? What, what things have we got going on there? Yeah, so I, I've worked with people all the way from like, you know, first time leaders, you know, new going from that individual contributor to kind of first level manager leader situation, all the way to some executive leaders and, you know, executive VPs and uh, CTO type stuff. And again, uh, the, the leadership development stuff, I, I still use kind of the foundation of the mindset ideas. Okay. And so, so we operate from what are, what are those, those changes we need to make? And then we go, go a level deeper. We were talking about earlier, you know, some of that, the, the change process of, you know, incompetence to competence and, and stuff like that. So I really love this book. Um, called Immunity to Change. This is from a couple of Harvard uh, psychologists. And, and this is some of the processes that I use to move through this, this mindset shift process, especially on the, on the leadership side. And so, so some of that, they, they have a process they call kind of going through this x-ray, like uncovering what's the, what's the big goal and the big change you're trying to make, but then what are those underlying things that might be working against you. It's almost like, so the idea of immunity to change, it's like there's this internal immunity. It's almost like having your foot on the brake and your foot on the gas at the same time, or sort of uh, working against each other. Um, these, these things that are internal, these, these belief systems or these, these, these things that we, we do that are actually working against the change that we're trying to make. And so we need to go through an x-ray process to uncover what is it that's actually holding us back so that then we can address that and start changing uh, those beliefs and, and challenging them over time. And so, so it's, it's still a really personal process. I haven't done a, a whole lot in like, you know, a larger organizational thing. I've done some group trainings and stuff like that. Um, but still most of the work I do on the leadership side is, is a really individual uh, process right now and um, helping people move through that. Um, and some of that people are trying to work on, like we talked about delegation or letting go or being more present, uh, think, you know, setting boundaries um, where, where I had one person I was working with who she was like, you know, burning out literally and physically and, and not setting boundaries and working crazy hours. And she had health issues because of that. And so how do, we, how does she still do great work while setting appropriate boundaries? Other people were trying to work on executive presence and strategic communication and stuff like that. So a lot of different things, um, that people might apply in terms of what they're trying to work on, but what's underlying them that's keeping them from actually making those changes. And we try and move through that process. And interesting, some of the coaching that we've talked about is probably useful for a, for a manager who's having to look for those elements within their own staff, I presume. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know, trying to optimize and help people get in the right situations and, and align work with their own genius zones and their own interests and, and things like that. So that, you know, get the right people on the bus, as Jim Collins would say, if you've read any of his stuff, uh, get the right people on the bus and in the right seats. We're getting a good uh, uh, set of, a good reading list here. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, I could talk books all day, uh, but uh, yeah. well, I think that's important as well, isn't it? The amount that you're reading, you know, being able to take so much stuff on board um, is always going to be valuable for being able to explain and coach other people. Um, this one might be slightly off off topic, I guess, but for, for anyone who has any mental health related issues, I suppose. So, uh, as an example, I have ADHD. So, do you? Do you apply any sort of specifics for people who are trying to go through all of the same stuff we've talked about, career, leadership, et cetera, but then have this sort of discomfort of the mind is probably an interesting way of phrasing yeah. that. Um, <laughs> do, do, are, there, do you, are there any techniques, et cetera, that you can uh, help me with there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So apologize. I don't have anything specific there. And I've worked with a few people with ADHD and, uh, you know, we're on uh, some, some part of the spectrum, uh, autism spectrum or something like that. And, and some different things, you know, like I said, some of those things, you know, might be much better uh, applied to a therapist or something like that, who has a specialty in those things. Um, I'd say that though, most of the principles we're talking about are, are reasonably universal and should be able to apply to, to people, whether they have, you know, particular diagnoses or not. And, and so if it, you know, some of these things work, we're still going to use a lot of the same, uh, tools and, and processes, you know, anyone who has something like that, I'd say, let, let's see and, and, you know, figure out how we can utilize some of 
that particular diagnosis and situation as a strength rather than only seeing it as a label of weakness. Mm. I always try and see it as a superpower. Yeah, great. <laughs> Although Sam will, Sam will attest to the weaknesses that I have in our scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought it was in, it's an interesting topic because I think, you know, the, all of the stuff you mentioned in terms of coaching is does apply, I think. It's just in case of um, uh, remembering to do it to a certain degree for, for ADHD, people with ADHD, but I imagine that it's probably the same uh, for most people. Is Do you find that from session to session you have people haven't made the progress that they said that they were going to make. I mean, I used to teach people guitar and I'd find that week after week after week, I was teaching them pretty much the same lesson because they hadn't practiced. Yeah, certainly. I mean, so, you know, different people are more engaged or, you know, life happens. And, and so sometimes we need to have kind of a reset and figure out, okay, you know, are you really committed to this process or, or not? And, and what needs to change to, to open up that space so that you can do this work? Because um, it is work right? To, to go through this, um, you know, practice that you're putting in time, reflection, space you need to take. And so sometimes people have situations in their lives, we kind of need to take a break and then we come back later. Uh, and that's okay. I'm willing to, to give them that space if they need to, but, you know, try and try and uh, keep them accountable and keep them rolling as much as possible if, if we can. So that's some of the, you know, just the benefits of that accountability and that commitment. If they're, if they've invested in something financially, usually they're, they're more willing to to, to keep keep with it because they're they've committed to it right you'd hope so i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean as we come to as we, we we draw to a close are there any other final uh points thoughts you want to leave us with any any uh, inspiration yeah so well first of all i mean we've had a we've had a fun conversation and, and people are uh listening to this um you know exercising or mowing the lawn or out driving or whatever and 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 i neglected to to mention this earlier but uh some of the some of the base tools especially around career clarity we were talking about genius zones and five whys and stuff like that i put together uh, a free resource for listeners of that tech show that they can go check out at www.engineeringcareeraccelerator.com slash tts so people can go grab that um just for listeners of the show to go get some of their some free resources and, and a resource i call the career clarity checklist to, and some of the tools we've talked about today. Um, so they don't feel like they need to remember everything. They, they've got some, some free things to go check out. So at www.engineeringcareeraccelerator.com slash TTS. Then go grab that. Um, and, and so that, that's what I would leave people with is to go take some action, go grab that, see, uh, and, and go through some of those exercises. If you're serious about uncovering your genius zone and you know figuring out where you want to be in your career and uh, making some intentional moves, it, it's stuff worth spending time on um, instead of just being reactive and hoping that good things come your way. Like be proactive and and intentional about you know the, the areas and and things you want to work on. And then you know feel free to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn or otherwise or or, or another coach and, and get some help, uh, get some support. Don't don't make these changes alone because. Yeah. young kids these days say a lot of YOLO, uh, you only live <laughs> once, usually talking about, you know, let me do something stupid here because, because YOLO, but, but I say, yeah, you only, you only live once. So, so make it worth it. Do something worthwhile, do something, um, that matters that, that you're excited about. So, so be intentional about that. Right. So, uh, looking at it that way. So that's some of the things I'd leave, leave us on there. All right, great. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we'll make sure we get that in the show notes as well. And uh, as we put some of these on YouTube now, there should be a little button that you can click on. Uh, so I'm saying that ahead of time with this ma magic editing coming. Uh <laughs> That's excellent. All right. So thank thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris and Sam, for having me. It's been a pleasure and a fun conversation, and uh, look forward to to sharing this. was actually really cool straight off the back of that i was i was i've been working with uh, a business coach not not necessarily a mindset coach uh, i was inspired to give him a call because uh, i hadn't actually finished all my sessions with him because i do think it's pretty important to have that kind of outside perspective someone kind of rein you in when you start to go off the off the rails as like a business owner myself so uh it was really cool i i, I enjoyed just listening and and taking in what what jeff had to say about the importance of having again that outside perspective 
Yeah, so if you uh, actually get yourself a coach off the back of this episode or you've had some good experiences with coaches, um, then maybe just drop us a line and let us know about it. It'd be interesting to hear from you. Have you ever had a, like some sort of coach or anything? Uh, I have a couple of mentors and I do probably, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be looking into getting some coaching actually. In fact, I'm on a waiting list, but that's more to do with my, uh, my mental health issues. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I will get a coach. We'll see. Yeah. But anyway, uh, thanks for sticking around until the end. Remember to follow or subscribe if you haven't already and, uh, leave us a review over on Podchaser. Um, a comment on YouTube, wherever you'd like to, really. That'll help uh, people get a glimpse of whether this episode is right for them, and uh, they might want to listen to some other episodes that we've put out as well in the past. Just do it all. Just go everywhere and do it. Do everything. It's, it'll be nice. Gives us that little confidence boost. Only leave good ones, though. Yes. We only like good ones. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's create an echo chamber. Positive echo chamber. Yes. We like to be in a bubble. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, next time we have Peter O'Driscoll, who is the managing director of Ringo. And I remember this episode because it was a really good one. I uh, really enjoyed speaking to Peter. So it should be a good one. So tune into that. But also, big news. This will be, for you know, foreseeable future, the last ever That Tech Show episode. Episode 74. It's been 74 good old episodes. And and thank you so much for joining the ride. But we've decided to kind of close doors and just focus on uh, separate things and and kind of leave this wonderful season where it is because it's been a fab old season, hasn't it, Chris? It has. It's been a fun ride. It has been a fun ride. Yeah. So join us for that last one. We'll see you then.